Welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia. My name is Laura Kovacs, and I'm honored to introduce our guests this evening. The host of BET News, Black News Tonight, and Upfront, Mark Lamont Hill is the Steve Charles Chair in Media, Cities, and Solutions at Temple University. His books include Nobody, Casualties of America's War on the Vulnerable from Ferguson to Flint and beyond, and Except for Palestine, The Limits of Progressive Politics. He also owns Uncle Bobby's Coffee and Books and is the founding director of the People's Education Center, a Germantown-based nonprofit organization devoted to community education. Todd Brewster is the co-author with Peter Jennings of the number one New York Times bestseller, The Century. His other work includes the books Lincoln's Gamble and In Search of America. He also taught journalism at Temple University, was a Knight Fellow at Yale Law School, and was the founding director of the Center for Oral History at West Point. He is also the executive producer of the documentary Into Harm's Way. In their new book, Seen and Unseen, the authors examine the uniqueness of this moment in the overall history of civil rights movements in the United States. Joining them in conversation this evening is award-winning award -winning broadcaster and journalist, Tracy Matisak. Please join me in welcoming our guests back to the Free Library. I'm thrilled to see you all. Thank you again for coming. Um, all of that said, um, why don't we dive in and start talking about the book Seen and Unseen. Todd and Mark, thank you, and welcome back to the Free Library of Philadelphia. Thank you. Yeah, it's our pleasure. So um, I want to talk about your partnership first on this book. Um, I know that Todd wrote the foreword to another book of yours, Mark, and, and Todd, I know that you did a lot of work with Peter Jennings. You mm -hmm. wrote a number of books together. But Mark, um, talk a little bit about how you came to collaborate on this book and sort of who did what? Yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you for, for hanging out with us tonight. It's <laughs> Wouldn't be anywhere else. <laughs> <laughs> How about the Sixers game? I mean, Not you know. even there. <laughs> <laughs> That's everyone else, right? <laughs> um, it is, uh, it's such a pleasure to be back at the Free Library and to be talking to everyone here. Um, Todd and I initially met, we, we have the same agent. It's, I wish it were more like cool story, but it, we, we, we have the same agent uh, who uh, did a wonderful job of bringing us together. When I was uh, thinking about a book on Ferguson and started to write about what was going on, uh, Todd was in town, I believe, and we all hung out and had lunch. Uh, and when it was time to think about the forward for the book, um, and Todd was a, is a great reader, a great editor, a great everything, but when it was time to write the forward for the book, George said, hey, this is the guy you want. And I'd read The Century, I'd read um, some of his other work, um, and I knew that he was a phenomenal writer. And when I was on, uh, when I was hosting HuffPost Live, he came on to talk about his book, Lincoln's Gamble. And so I had an opportunity to read his work. Uh, and so, and, and his sense of history. And I thought, wow, this would be a great thing to do. And then life goes on and you do other projects, you work on other things. And um, the pandemic happened and the uprisings happened. And, uh, and George called again. And this time he said, you know, you should think about doing another project, this time maybe one with Todd. And I said, well, you know, I've written other books with people and that's, it's, it's always been great, but I'm not necessarily thinking about this. We said, well, just take a call with him. So then we, we talked on the phone and, and we, had, we had a bunch of ideas and we came up with an idea that resonated with both of us. And we were super excited about, um, about writing together and thinking together. And in terms of division of labor, you know, every collaboration is different. Some collaborations you, one person you know, writes the first draft, the other person edits and fixes. Some people trade chapters. It just depends on, on, on the collaboration. Uh, for this one, you know, every, every chapter took a, a slightly different form. Um, I think a, a lot of it was brainstorming through an idea, outlining the idea, breaking down every place we we're going to go. And then after we go there, we'd sketch it out and then say Todd would pass it to me and then I'd say, you know, we're going, we each would nerd out in our respective areas. So, you know, I'd be like, Todd, no, we don't actually need to know the entire history, you, you know what I mean, of the firefly, <laughs> right? And, and the sentence doesn't need to be seven pages long. <laughs> right? <laughs> and, and, and then conversely, uh, you know, sometimes I would be so invested in, because I, I've been doing current events so long lately, you know, with media, I'd, I'd be very much interested in the currentness of the story, and Todd mm -hmm. was always pulling me back to give the story more legs, yeah. to, to give a deeper sense of history. 
um, and honestly to be more literary and, and, and rich in my writing. Mm -hmm. So um, it, 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 it's, it's been a fun collaboration. Yeah. Todd, this book has heavy and difficult material in it. And I'm just curious about what your conversations were like as the two of you worked on this and, and sort of immersed yourselves in not only difficult recent events, but also difficult historical events. Yeah, I mean, we, that, that's one of the great things about the collaboration. We, we would talk pretty regularly, but um, at the same time, every conversation landed on something very deep and profound. Right. I mean, and one of the revelations I think of the whole process was that even as we were retelling the stories of of um, Ahmaud Arbery, or to retelling the story of, of George Floyd, or retelling the story of uh, um, uh, Kenosha or um, Charlottesville, uh, and getting deeper into what the um, the actual details were, which a retelling can allow you to do. Right. We live in a very fast-paced world in which everything is running. We, we think we know something, but then when you go back, you can find out a much deeper sense of it. What we really found, and I think what is the biggest contribution of this book, is that the roots of this, the roots are, are uh, deep, and they run throughout American history, well back into the past, last century, well back into the century before that, such that the use of film, uh, the still photograph, um, uh, 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 photojournalism, um, uh, personal photography, and then ultimately the use of the, uh, the cell phone video and video, I mean, we just had the 30th anniversary of Rodney King, you know, which was not a cell phone video, but was a video, yeah. and was a compelling video that sort of started us onto this role of citizen journalism. But each time we realized that this doesn't, this, this episode, Kenosha didn't happen in a vacuum. Right. Charlottesville did not happen in a vacuum. These are the bubbling up of, of, of a rich history that is extremely dark and in a lot of ways. It's also very hopeful. We found a lot of hopeful moments. But we as Americans need to confront just how rich the uh, history and, and rich and dark the history is of America's uh, uh, relationship with race and how that has played out in our media. Yeah. The birth of a nation. Um, uh, the, the, the Gone with the Wind, uh, the, the terrible, terrible photographs of the lynchings of the late 19th century and early 20th century, the role of those photographs at first in continuing the kind of level of racism and then ultimately shocking and shaming the nation towards what they were doing. But I think that was the revelation, I would say, was that the role of media wasn't just new. It, the newness was only the most recent manifestation yeah. of, of something that had been playing out and has gone back both ways both hopefully, there was a lot of hope. Photojournalism of the 1960s was extremely powerful for the civil rights movement and also very dark. Yeah. And I want to circle back to <clears throat> Birth of a Nation and Gone mm. with the Wind in a little bit, but Mark, the book is largely about the democratization of technology and changing, yeah. in effect, who gets to document history now. Um, and you write that, and I'm quoting here, it sometimes feels as though the history of communications will one day be understood to be divided between everything that came before the cell phone and everything that came after it, and the story of race in America will be different for it. Um, talk about why that's so significant. I think it goes to that question of democratization. People have access to this. Who here has a cell phone? <laughs> now, who here, my mother's in the crowd. I know she, ah. she, she does not have um, a phone. I mean, uh, that has a camera or a video footage option on her phone. It has a wire on it yeah, that goes yeah, into yeah, the wall. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> she has the first cell phone in human history. I mom. But for everybody else, who has, who has a video footage? Who has a video camera on their phone? Who can video record, live stream? Who has, a, right. So, you know, if I had asked the same question 10 years ago, we'd have half the crowd, you know. Mm. Uh, just on the, if I'd asked who had a cell phone 10 years ago, most people would raise their hand, but almost no would have the high end, P, you know, sort of PDA kind of phone and so forth. Um, but as time has gone on, having a cell phone is no longer a luxury. Having high quality video footage capabilities on your phone is no longer a luxury. Mm -hmm. And so that means everybody has access to this. Now, not the same level of access, and what we do with that access changes, right? Race isn't neutral, class and gender aren't neutral on this. But there's something about having access to this technology that changes the game when we mm -hmm. talk about uh, technology, when we talk about race, when we talk about the struggle for racial justice. When, when, when Darnella Frazier 
And y- y'all know Darnella Frazier. Darnella Frazier is the woman, the young sister who took the video footage of George Floyd being killed. You may not know her name, but you know what she did. And it's important that we raise the names of those people who are courageous enough to stand in front of state power in videotape, because that takes courage too. It takes courage to stand in front of police when they got guns and they're looking to, ke- to give somebody a charge and you sitting there videotaping this, right? And so that footage allowed us to get a window into something that we otherwise could not mm-hmm. see. As Todd said, 30 years ago, there was an uprising in LA after the cops were found not guilty after the previous year, Rodney King had been beaten on videotape. So the technology allows us to tell a story that wasn't getting told by mainstream media, that wasn't being told by state power. Now, in 1991, the odds of getting a beating recorded was almost impossible. Y'all, some of y'all are old enough to know, seasoned enough to know, um, <laughs> how, big it, how big a thing it was to videotape something. You need the big camcorder, you need to have a VHS tape, you probably already had something taped on it, you had to stick a little piece of uh, a paper in the little hole so you could tape over the thing you taped the night, you taped Matlock the night before. And, <laughs> And suddenly you had this whole thing you had to do and you had to catch the spectacle. You had to have that stuff there while the thing was happening. Now you just pull out your phone. So now being able to just pull out your phone allows you to to, to capture everyday events. It allows you to stream your life. It allows you to live blog. It allows you to tell everybody what you're eating, where you're going, what you're thinking about, what's, what you're mad about, all of it in real time. Mm-hmm. Now, sometimes that can be frustrating when people are going on in a timeline about something you don't care about. Or somebody's going live like it's a big event and they just go into the supermarket. That might frustrate you, but then there's the moment where a fight breaks out. Then there's the moment where somebody comes with an AR weapon to a rally and shoots people. Then there's the moment where the police are are, are, are shooting at somebody mm-hmm. as they're running away, Walter Scott. Or we could look in Grand Rapids, right, mm-hmm. just last week. And so this was a story that was hard to tell. Now, we, black folk and people who love justice of all races have a, but, but I'm focusing specifically on black folk because we were the ones being lynched, we were the ones being mm-hmm. enslaved, we were the ones being harmed. That's some technology right there. <laughs> um, we always use the best technology we had to tell those stories. Right. That's what Todd was talking about, the, the, the camera. Martin Luther King was using technology. He was, he was relying on the technology of, the, of, of, of mainstream media to tell mm-hmm. the story of what was happening on Edmund Pettus Bridge. He's like, we're going to get beat, but we're not going to get beat in private anymore. Right. Ida B. Bills Barnett was like, we're going to show the lynching, the same pictures they're using as, as, photo, as, as, as um, postcards. postcards mm-hmm. right? We're going to use to stir outrage. Yeah. You know? so, but now... We don't need a, a, a $5,000 camera. Now we don't need yeah. access to a media crew. Now we can just pull out that phone yeah. and tell the story. So that means everybody here has a fighting chance. Not an equal chance, and we're going to get into that, but a fighting chance. Yeah. And, and Todd, but here's the, the question that comes to mind in all of that. And you mentioned Grand Rapids, so Patrick Loyola, right? Um, and so there's dash cam video, there's cell phone video, there's home surveillance video, there's body cam video. Um, there's all of this video, and as it relates to cameras, for all of their ubiquity, they are not necessarily a guarantee that justice is going to be served, right? Um, they're not necessarily even a deterrent. Well, we have, I think we've both recognized in this era the miracle of video and what it can do. We've also begun to learn, recognize the limits of video, such that video in some respect, you know, our book is called Seen and Unseen, right? Two people can look at the same piece of video and come to very different conclusions. It's what you bring with the eyes. And this in some sense is, is actually analogous to the historical roots that we, we bring out in the book. Your, your eyes are, don't come um, uh, c- completely w- without a, a history. They come mm. with a certain amount of knowledge that you apply to what you see. You know, I, 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 one of the things my family who, who, who's here will know this tiresome thing that I always say to them because I, what I teach, the First Amendment, I say it. The First Amendment allows you to say what you want to say. This is what students say, you know, and I say, well, to some degree with some exceptions, but yes, you're right. You can say whatever you want to say. Uh, but you have responsibility to listen, and here's the third element. You have a responsibility to be willing to be changed by what you hear. Well, you have responsibility to be willing to be changed by what you see. That's what we all need to bring to the video that we see, right? Yeah. So you could take the story, for instance, of 
um, of uh, Kenosha. Uh, and the uh, and Kyle Rittenhouse, I'll just remind all of you, a 17-year-old boy who comes across the border from Illinois, um, armed uh, uh, to join those who are protecting private property, right, in Kenosha. These terms are loaded. Property, you know, black people were, for a lot, most of American history, a good chunk of American history, considered to be property. So let's right. not forget that. And that comes up also in the Ahmaud Arbery story. But he's there to protect property. And he ends up um, uh, shooting and killing two people, two protesters. Right. Uh, one, a man who had only that day been released from uh, the mental health ward of a prison. Um, another who was actually trying to stop him, uh, who was, uh, he, was a he was a shooter on the run. He had already killed the first. Mm -hmm. So there was an element of what would stop the mass murder who may be among us kind of thing, right? So there were complicated things were happening. But those of us who look at the video with a certain set of eyes would say, oh, we know what's happened, you know, and it's tragic. And this 17-year-old boy, who, whatever his age, was in a position where he, he had actually uh, 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 encouraged the, the very events that he participated in and that resulted in the loss of two lives. There, but that video, that same video, has been refashioned to be shown as an agent to raising defense funds for Kyle Rittenhouse. Yep with a different kind of narration, a different approach to the, word, the, the, the images you're seeing. Now you see them in a completely different way, encouraged by the voice of a narrator who's pulling upon some historical references that others of us don't wish to uh, entertain in our, on our moral judgment of something. And so video is very, a great tool. Technology is amoral, right? We need right. to remember that. And we need curators in the end, we've discovered. We still need curators. Free speech is wonderful, but it helps when people, the, the speech is constructive and it leads to people actually helping us understand what's happening, not just expressing something. Yeah. I want to talk a little bit about the birth of a nation. Um, mm. You know, you talk in the book about, um, well, let me, let me back up a little bit before I get to that. Um, because in the book, Mark, you cite the American Civil War as a prominent example of white storytellers controlling the narrative, um, which Robert Penn Warren called our felt history, the history lived in the national imagination, I'm quoting here. Yes. Um, so there was this northern view of liberty. Um, there was the black view of felt history, which was quite different. And then, of course, there was the southern myth of the lost cause. And I wonder if you can address um, those competing views of that time and how the lost cause in particular has continued to gain traction even till today. Yeah, it had like a, a, a remix, <laughs> uh, you know, with the red hats and, you know, the presidency of Donald Trump. I mean, there's been a real nostalgia, not for the lost cause per se, but for, but for certain key dimensions of it, right? <sighs> Um, and some people are explicitly saying, no, the, the, the Civil War was, was fought for this, for, for this noble grand purpose. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and so let me back up just for a moment, because I, I think, and Todd, please jump in on this, mm -hmm. as, 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 the history, as the history nerd and the Civil War nerd <laughs> in particular uh, of the duo here. But um, part of it is that people have to understand that history is always, um, it's not a site of objectivity any more than anything else. Right? There are always competing narratives mm -hmm. about how a story is told, about what happened. Mm -hmm. And as we know, the powerful are often best resourced to tell that story. And so how we understand history, how we understand um, change over time is shaped by who has the ability to document history books, who mm -hmm. has the ability to offer their narrative, who has the ability to codify their narrative in, in the law and all of these other things. This is all part of the power of it. And, and so the reason we lean on birth of, part of the reason why we lean on birth of a nation is because birth of a nation becomes another way that this, ter this terrain of struggle that we call history is fought for. It's not just in the, in the history classroom, it's also on the screen. Because on the screen now, you can have an image of black people as lazy, as black people as sexual predators, black people as in equipped, unready for democracy. And these types of narratives play out in the, in the popular imagination. So when people watch Birth of a Nation, or they watch a much milder form, but still problematic form of racism, and subtle forms of racism, and the kind of the southern nostalgia of gone with the wind, mm -hmm. right? 
you can see how this thing plays out. And so for the South, many people in the South, the idea that the, that the Civil War was simply a valiant attempt to rescue states, to salvage states' rights and to protect the interests of, 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 of Southern uh, governmental structure and that it wasn't about enslavement, that it wasn't about domination, that it wasn't about all these other things, is a very particular narrative that is held on by people even after the Civil War. Now, they didn't win. So to a large extent, that's not the dominant narrative that prevails in American history, but it is one that allows people to hold on to a type of Southern pride, a type of Confederate nostalgia, a type of belief that we were on the right side of history. Yeah. We just lost the war, but we were on the right side of history, and, you know, and, and we have a right to these, these, these practices and rituals and texts and memories and images and flags and statues and, and monuments and all the stuff that's still being fought for right now and marched for uh, in places like Charlottesville. And so all of this plays out, yeah. Yeah, to add to that, so the story of the birth of not many people who know you know the, the, the reputation of the birth of a nation as a racist film, but the story is the reuniting of two families, a northern family and a southern family, in their common cause, the common cause being that the, the north strayed, right? The north strayed from the sort of, the, 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 uh, the, the principles that the south was willing to defend. And so the ultimate, uh, union of the, in, that happens in the birth of a nation is that the two families join together in marriage. And that is a sense of, uh, well, James Baldwin described the birth of a nation as a two hour long justification for mass murder. Mm. Pithy phrase, but a powerful one, right? When he did that, what he's essentially saying is that the, the myth of the lost cause was an attempt to join white peoples across the, 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 the political spectrum at the time, and rewrite the history of the Civil War to negate what had happened after the Civil War, not only the Civil War amendments to the Constitution, but even more profoundly, the granting of power to black people, which had happened in Reconstruction and then had to be reversed according to the principles of the South. When that happens, we have a number of moments in American history where monuments are built to Confederate generals and Confederate heroes. One of the waves happens right around the time of, this, of, this, of the uh, birth of a nation. The advertisements for the film, The Birth of a Nation, appeared next to advertisements to join the Ku Klux Klan. Mm -hmm. So it is a revival of the South, in a sense saying, let's look at the war again and let's see it with different eyes, just as we talked before about how seeing the same thing and seeing it differently, right? It's also interesting, real quick. It's the first film that's shown at the White House. Woodrow Wilson has a screening of this in the White It's the first film ever shown in the White House. Another interesting point that I think reflects, I'll be real quick, is W.E.B. Du Bois, Marcus Garvey. They attempted to raise funds to make a counter movie to Birth of a Nation. They couldn't get the resources up. So this is reflective of the same challenge we have today. Dominant corporate media has the power and the resources to construct a particular narrative, and those of us who don't have the same perspective, don't often have the resources to push back with the same kind of megaphone. Now these tools, these weapons of the weak, as James Scott would say, are helpful. Because I can push back on Twitter, I can push back on Instagram, I can push back on TikTok, but it ain't the same as Birth of a Nation, just like it ain't the same as Fox News, right? I can tweet all day, but that ain't the same thing as Tucker Carlson. Similarly, there, there, there was a challenge back then about this. So this was a powerful moment. Well, we can't ignore the fact there was also a technological uh, advancement. It was a, it, in terms of the mode and genre of film, it was a huge advancement. It, 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 it was a game changer in many ways. And so many people were drawn to the film, not just for its content, but for the actual construction of the film itself, which made it a very complicated and messy thing. And let's remember the myth of the lost cause, the word myth is really critically important here. Not only because it reflects on falsehoods, but because it reflects on this kind of dewy-eyed sense of, of a, a rich, shared kind of, uh, kind of fundamental history that informs the heart, right? And, and all being explained in a medium that is as magical to them at that time as artificial intelligence is to us now. Mm. So it was exciting and it was also like tapping into the ether, to use a favorite phrase of mine, uh, that to pull these sort of things that are om that are non-literal, right, into into the into the public uh, sphere, and to say that oh, but yes, we know th that the armies of the north of the north overwhelm the armies of the south, but the real power is mm -hmm. in these myths, and they they outlast even the, uh, 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 a war victory that came 
through the guns and the uniforms. Very well, nice. and along those lines, Mark, as I was reading the book and, and reading about the lost cause, and I, I couldn't help but think about the big lie and whether there is a direct line that goes from the lost cause to stop the steal to the big lie about the election that I guess the question is, is stop the steal possibly an extension or a modern day version of the lost cause? Absolutely. It, 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 it empowers people to uh, make choices that they otherwise could not justify within the context of liberal democracy. Mm -hmm. right? So I can say, well, of course I believe in democracy. I, I'm the one wearing the American flag. I'm the one saying, make America great again. I couldn't justify overthrowing the government unless the election's not real, mm -hmm. unless they stole it. Then, then I can do it. And then when evidence is marshaled to substantiate that claim, or people who are respected do not denounce the claim, even though they know it's not true, mm -hmm. right? Think about all the people who are sort of, who, who remain silent in the face of Trump saying the election was rigged and stolen, et cetera, et cetera. They didn't, they didn't agree, they didn't say anything. Mm -hmm. There was like a tacit approval. When all of that is happening, it allows people to hold on to their, their assumptions of the world. It allows people to, to, to not disrupt their practices. W similarly to this, this myth, right? I can hold on to the Confederate logic. I can hold on to my beliefs about slavery. I can hold on to, to, to anti-black racism. I can hold on to American apartheid because I believe that I was fighting a more grand and noble cause, mm -hmm. right? And I'm willing, to, as you pointed out, to even organize, i.e. join the Ku Klux Klan at the time because this was a huge recruitment tool for the two Ku Klux Klan. Mm -hmm. I, can, I can do that. Similarly, this is a recruitment tool for uh, the pro-Trump wing of the Republican Party and for more broadly outside of electoral politics, just a kind of re renaissance of white nationalism, yeah. which never went anywhere, but just got much more energized in this moment. Yeah. Um, Todd mentioned, Mark, just a moment ago, James Baldwin, and you write about the rise of the influencer as a byproduct of social media. Um, and you make the point that way before there was YouTube and there was Instagram, there was James Baldwin. Um, can you talk about why he is such a seminal figure, not only as a novelist and an activist, but um, from the 20th century, but why he is transcendent and still so relevant even in the 21st? It's an interesting question, and, and, and this is actually an idea that Todd kind of brought to me as we were talking through it, um, so I'd love to hear your, your thought on this as well. Um, but I mean, part, this is an interesting moment for Twitter. In the post-Ferguson moment, uh, the Ferguson uprisings of 2014 after Mike Brown was killed, we began to see a couple of people really kind of re-emerge in this generation's consciousness. One of those people was Asada Shakur, right? A uh, political prisoner, uh, exiled in uh, Cuba right now. At, the begin at every rally I was at at Ferguson, people would start to say, you know, we, we must love and support each other, right? Uh, you, you would hear the kind of the, the, the language of, um, of, um, of Asada Shakur, right? We have nothing to lose but our chains, right? Um, and her quotes would start to emerge again, right? We saw Malcolm X reemerge, right? But Baldwin, more than anybody else, when you actually look at the numbers, the number of quotes on Twitter post-2014, the person most cited, most quoted in all of this is James Baldwin. Now, some of it makes sense. I mean, James Baldwin is just a genius. He deserves to be quoted and cited everywhere at all times because that's what he is. That's who he is. But there's a way that his influence has shaped conversation. It shaped narratives. I think part of it is that he's a compelling figure. I think part of it is that he's written across such a wide range of genres. Part of it is that as a black queer male, um, he, at a moment where people were talking about intersectional politics and intersectional leadership, I think he makes for a very powerful and convenient figure. And some of it is people are quoting him out of context. Mm -hmm. Some of it is people don't really fully appreciate Baldwin's message and that sometimes they're quoting him to, say, to be saying the exact opposite um, mm -hmm. of what he's actually saying. And so for me, the idea of him as influencer is somewhat fascinating because when we think of the influencer, we think of the modern person. Right. We think of the, and it's also interesting to think about what it means to be an influencer. That was not a category that existed before, right? There were people who had influence, there were celebrities, but now the idea of influencer as idea, where it could be, it could be a teenager, it could be mm -hmm. someone who just, who, who does tummy tees, right? And suddenly there, or someone who wears Fashion Nova, someone who listens to certain kind of music, suddenly they are influencing public opinion, they have millions of followers, mm -hmm. and, and they're shaping and driving culture. That's a very different moment in terms of how it plays out. 
And uh, Baldwin, ironically, is one who was doing it not in his own time, although he did, uh, but certainly more now. And the last thing I'd say on that is that it's somewhat interesting that at, in the height of Baldwin's popularity, he was somewhat marginalized. Mm -hmm. Baldwin couldn't speak at the March on Washington for jobs and freedom, just like Baird Rustin couldn't. In fact, mm -hmm. you know, people like A. Philip Randolph said, no, it, it, it threatened King if he let those people speak mm -hmm. at, the, at the dates. You know right. what you think about it? Martin Luther King actually helped, we, we, we referenced Robert Penn Warren's notion of, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we had this felt history, but the felt history also part was there was this, uh, on the 100th anniversary of the Civil War that we were celebrating uh, America's uh, 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 coming to a sort of second founding in the Civil War, rejecting slavery, um, r r raising the notion of equality to be equal to the notion of freedom, all these things. And, and there, there was a sort of celebration that happened. And, and Martin Luther King fell into that not as an aspirational uh, yeah. uh, message. Uh, uh, Baldwin was very different. <laughs> Baldwin was a brilliant writer, but he was also um, a, a brilliantly obstinate. And his uh, idea was that no, no, uh, we need, th this is not enough, affirmative action, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, small programs to uh, uh, better the lives of poor black people is not the answer to our, our, our sin is original, it came with our founding, he would be very interested, I think, to know about the 1619 Project, if you're alive today, to know about critical race theory, but he would have said, what is wrong with admitting our failures? What is wrong with admitting our mistakes? You know, he, his, what if his, his first chosen profession was to be a preacher. And you can tell this in his language. His, his, the, one of the reasons he's so great on Twitter is because he has that gift for the, for the phrase that just rings in the mind, that incorporates contradiction. So it's like, it, it, it's like uh, asymmetry. It, it sort of nags at the mind, right? Yeah. And, and so you see it emerge into Twitter because it, it, can be, it can quickly communicate something, and it sticks in your head. It has, it has stickiness, to use a phrase that is used in, in, in modern internet uh, uh, lingo. But, but the fact that he wanted us to say, no, we need to admit what we've done. There's nothing wrong with admitting failure and trying again, right? Our last chapter is called Another Chance, and it, it is in part a response to what Baldwin, and our book is called Seen and Unseen, by the way, which is also reference to Baldwin, who wrote a book called The Evidence of Things Not Seen, which was a book about the 19, early 1980s when there was a, a wave of the murders of, of children at, in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. And he went, and his last book actually he published was, was The uh, Evidence of Things Not Seen, but it also quotes from, it, it's a reference from the Bible. So you see, he, he had this gift for language. And we think of him as an activist, in part, but he would have rejected that and said the only reason he had to be an activist was because he was a black, he was a writer and he was black, but he really wanted to be thought of as a writer of universal values. And the universal values would include that people who had made mistakes, like white America, yeah. listened to white supremacists, you know, who had incorporated uh, a racism into our law. Well, how about reversing it? How about admitting it rather than papering over it? And so it's, he's an extremely powerful influence on the book I think we've seen, we, whether we've done seen and unseen, because I think it does go right to what are we willing to accept about ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Mark, you know, all you have to do is open your news feed now to see the reluctance to admit to our wrongdoings as a nation, um, to yeah. see the resistance against teaching the truth of history, um, allowing you know, children to understand some things that really happened in this country. Talk a little bit about that, if you would, about the resistance that we still see today. Yeah, I, I think we live in a country that grows old but doesn't grow up. Mm. It, it continues to hold on to very immature conceptions that um, hinge on us not allow, uh, allowing us to say this original sin, whether we call, talk about it as capitalism, racial capitalism, racism, slavery. I mean, we, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's enough sin in there f for a few things. But the mix of it is something that we don't ever want to acknowledge. We don't want to come to terms with it. Now, we've done that in very, we've, re we've refused to come to terms with it in very direct and explicit ways, like in at the race conference in Durban, you know, 20, uh, 2000, 2000, summer 2001, right, where we literally were like, yo, we are not making an apology for slavery. Right, That's a very particular thing. But there's also a way in this country that we've decided that any type of race talk, any type of identification of race is an act of racism itself. Mm -hmm. That we would, the way that, that our, our grand democratic aspiration 
is to be colorblind, to act like we don't see race, mm -hmm. we don't see color, we don't know it, and that if we could just be colorblind, everything would be fine. Mm -hmm. But in doing so, one, we, we, we negate difference. We ignore the things that make us who we are. In other words, to see me as human, you have to not see my blackness. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's fundamentally problematic. But it also means that we're not willing to come to terms with the things that got us here that got us through those processes of racialization, that made, that made race a relevant factor, that made race the, the social construct a, a relevant one in our social world. America didn't want to come to terms with that. So when you get these fights against critical race theory, which are not about critical race theory, they've never been about critical race theory, they're not about Solorzano and Delgado and Kimberly, Cree. they're not about these legal theories in law school, uh, articles that like five people read, right, at the time, right? Mm -hmm. It's not about that. And it's a rich body of work that everyone, I think, is, 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 it's worthwhile to read. But it's about saying, and Christopher Rufo said this very directly, he said, I'm going to take the word critical race theory and make it signify everything about race that people don't like. Every bad story, every crazy idea, every controversial theory, I'm gonna call it all critical race theory, so that when people hear critical race theory, they won't want it. They even take 16, 19, throw that in there. Everything is critical race theory, so that when people hear it, they hear uh, danger, they hear victimhood, they hear blame. And in a world where white people don't want to be accountable for white supremacy or white privilege, and honestly don't even want to be known as white, they don't even want whiteness outed, right? That's a very convenient thing to do, to make the boogeyman of critical race theory. But it's not about 1619. It's about 2022. It's about 2024. It's about these elections. It's about amassing power and knowing that a, an, an enraged outrage, or at least an outraged group of white voters going into that voting booth will mean that we'll see a swing in the House, we'll see a swing in the Senate. We'll, we'll, just like we saw Trump elected, uh, out of outrage of we're losing our country, the same sentiment that animated um, the, the, the white public, the white South after, after birth of a nation, and so forth and so on and so on. And, and, and in an age of so-called democratization of technology and media, it makes it easier to get that message out. It makes it harder to filter. It doesn't take away the curators. To the contrary, as to Todd's point, it amplifies the number of curators, so you can get the curator you want. Mm, right. You know, you, you, can, you, can get, you can get Kyle Rittenhouse to tell you what's happening down there. You can get Tucker Carlson to tell you what just happened. And because you already want to see it a certain way, you're going to get out what you put in. Yeah. And, and that's a very dangerous, dangerous yeah, moment. It's a confirmation bias. It, exactly. Yeah. Um, let me end with this question before we go to questions from our audience, and I'd like each of you to briefly answer this. You close one of the chapters with the following words. Consider what it would have been like if technology, including the tools of the nascent art of movie making, had been available not only to embittered descendants of the Confederacy, like uh, D.W. Griffith, the maker of Birth of a Nation, but to those who would call out their lies, Here's a question, would our history flowing through different waters have made us a better people? More important, will the arrival of these tools make us better people now? So I put that question um, to each of you. Will the arrival of these tools make us better people now? What do you say? Uh, Todd, I'll go to you and then- Sure, Mark. yeah, no, I, I think it depends upon all of us how we use the tools, right? I mean, the tools, as I said before, are, don't come with a morality. They don't come branded with justice maker. You know, it's not like the, uh, the peacekeeper uh, bombs that you said. <laughs> you can't, you can't uh, take the technology and, and apply a moral compass to it. It depends on how we use it. It is, has been an empowering tool to constituencies that did not have it before. It is also a very malleable tool, and that means that we need to engage with it, and we need to engage with it daily and regularly in ways that to continue to promote, I think, the values that the best of us still adhere to. You know, we, we talked before about Baldwin. Baldwin's, uh, we mentioned that Baldwin's gift for language is in part why he's quoted uh, frequently on, on, in social media. But what's also sort of wonderful is the way that social media takes language, carves it up, repositions it, reverses some of Baldwin's own phrases. And as we say in the book, sometimes it doesn't look like Baldwin anymore, yeah, but it right. looks like something different that has evolved from Baldwin. Mm -hmm. Well, we've taken one good and productive and constructive thing, and we've added more constructive things to it. And that is using social media to its best purpose. 
the use of video as a truth teller is using video to its best purpose, right? So if we have the opportunity to use these tools, if we continue to be hopeful, if we continue to engage in the world in a, in a, in a belief that it can adhere to, the, to these important values, then I, yes, I think these tools are extremely important as truth tellers, as justice makers, as something that I think we can take advantage of as we try to create a better society. But it's up to us. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna answer your question with a quick story. So we started with George Floyd. That, this book was started with George Floyd. We said we have to tell the story of George Floyd. Mm -hmm. Then I came to tie it with another idea. I said, you know, we got to have a chapter on, and I didn't even know um, uh, her name yet. Uh, Jeanette. Jonetta Charles, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. I said, but I've seen this video so many times. Some y'all all said, you about to lose your job. <laughs> y'all know what You about to lose your job, right? So there's this woman, if y'all haven't seen it, y'all might have seen the remix, y'all might have seen or heard people say, there, there's this woman, a black woman, she is walking outside of uh, a strip club. Strip club. Yeah. yeah. She left her purse in there. Uh, that's what she said. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. So... <laughs> She said, I need to get back in there because I left, my, I left mm -hmm. my purse, you know, and security wasn't trying to hear it. And eventually the security guard ends up detaining her, mm -hmm. holding her, right? And she sees a camera. And she's like, that's when she started, you were about to lose your job. You were about to lose your job. Get this dance. And then she started dancing. She's like, because you're not, you not supposed to be detaining me. Right? Because you're detaining me for nothing. Yeah, you're detaining me for nothing. That's what she said, right? Yeah, yeah. And it was powerful. Oh, yeah. It was a beautiful moment. And I was like, we got to tell this story because it, 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 it's, it speaks to the power and possibility of people. People feel empowered by the camera. Yeah. People feel empowered. Uh, this, this woman who, was, who, who, had, who struggled with lots of things uh, was unable to get access. Do you think this black woman in the history of black women being beaten, being killed, being sexually assaulted by law enforcement? That's not even talk about it in everyday life that the hell the black women catch. But I'm talking about just by law enforcement and other insecurity and other state power, parole officers, correction officers, et cetera. She felt empowered in that moment yeah. to be able to fight back. That became another tool in her disposal. Mm. In her disposal. Now, and this security guard wasn't doing nothing wild. In fact, he actually posted the video on his own Facebook and said, yeah, I think this is kind of funny. And you know, he, he, he let her go. To, that wasn't a real issue at the thing. But it was the fact that it signified something. But she didn't know she became an internet viral sensation. Mm -hmm. This video went all around. We were at rallies. We were at election rallies. We were at protest rallies. When Donald Trump was about to lose, he, uh, people had made the video, you about to lose your job. And they had Biden and Obama. And, 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 and it became this whole rally cry, similar to how All Right, you know, uh, uh, Kendrick Lamar's All Right was a, was a rally cry in Ferguson for Ferguson Summer, right? Point being, she didn't know that she was an internet sensation. No, she was like your mother. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> she, didn't have a phone. she didn't have a phone. She had no, she had no YouTube. <laughs> she didn't know about none of that. So, but beyond that, she also was struggling with substance abuse. Mm -hmm. She was unhoused for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. She, she was trying to re find her family again. She, she didn't know any of this was happening because the world underneath her was falling because the social safety net was unavailable. So there was an entire world of resistance, an entire world of spectacle that, was, that, that utilized and mobilized her, but that she couldn't utilize and mobilize. And so I say that to say that these weapons of the weak are important. They may even be indispensable, but they're insufficient because they operate within a world where we still have huge gaps between the have-nots and the have-gots. We live in a world where there's still state violence we live in a world where people still don't have access to the things they need to be okay, food, clothing, and shelter, where Kiese Lehman would say, good love, healthy choices, and second chances. We ain't got none of that. So does it make us better people? No. Can it make us more accountable? Yes. But only if we commit to actually radically transforming the world in which these media platforms and technological advances exist. Until we do that, it's all moot. On that note, what do you say we go to our audience for, for your questions? You made some great points about the ubiquity of the technology and how it's available to everyone to use. But I'm despairing now because after looking at that gruesome uh, uh, murder of, of George Floyd, I thought, well, maybe this kind of thing would stop. But it's, it's only, if anything, accelerated its pace. And these people who are, who they're so shameless, they lie. 
um, that crazy uh, congresswoman from Georgia, Green, I think Georgia her name Taylor is. Taylor Green. She, she, she was sending out tweets encouraging uh, Trump to uh, declare martial law, which she spelled M-A-R-S-H-A-L-L. <laughs> she never lets us down, does she? Uh, you know, and we have tapes of this. We have transcripts of this. We have them on camera, but it doesn't do any good because the vast audience of, of uh, Fox dwarfs whatever you had. I used to watch your show every night. Thank um, you. <laughs> and I try to get my friend, but yeah. where do we go from here? I, I like to take that one. Sure. So, I, you know, this shows the depth of the problem, right? I mean, I, I don't think that means that the, the, the video of George Floyd was uh, not uh, uh, important, powerful, impactful. Um, it had a certain power that, I, I, we discussed this at length in the first couple of chapters of the book, that went beyond, sadly, the multitude of videos that we've had starting with Rodney King and going all the way through, um, uh, the, uh, including Walter Scott and other, and, and in part because it was this long drawn out death that was like a crucifixion. I mean, it really was uh, uh, something um, that riveted the consciousness. Uh, it, you marry that up with what we said earlier about James Baldwin and what he understood about his own time. And while he would have loved to have spoken at the March on Washington, I think he knew the March on Washington was still a blip in the story of American history and that it would require a steady pace not a drop by drop, but a river by river in a sense, right? To be communicating the very things that these videos do tell us about ourselves until we will finally confront our own history honestly. And yes, you wake up in the morning, it feels a little, as we talked backstage, about Grand Groundhog Day, right? I mean, you end up feeling that there, here's this, this day's video. It's daunting, it's disturbing. Um, but it should just re-energize us. I do, I do think that, I mean, I am a hopeful person. I do think that, the, that, that George, the George Floyd response was a powerful, impactful thing. I think it did change minds. I think it moved people to action. But um, now, today is another day, and we have to pick up the same cause one more time. I'm um, just curious, uh, you know, this week with uh, Elon Musk buying Twitter, um, just Curious to think about where you guys see some of this technology going and how we use it. Um, you know, I think people have talked about uh, the culture in his company in Tesla, um, you know, the culture around race there, um, and some of their concerns about where he might take the platform in the future. But just curious where you guys see these things going if, you know, people will still be able to bring light to these issues in the same way on that platform. Um, and, you know, just yeah. where you see things going. Yeah, you know, I, I, it's a good question. and, and it's, it's at the forefront of everyone's minds, assuming the sale goes through. You know, fingers crossed that it doesn't, but um, it likely will. I, I think it, it's disturbing to me for multiple reasons. One, again, it's a reflection of a larger problem. Twitter isn't just a platform. In many ways, it's, it functions as a public sphere, right? It, it, it is the ground on which we have the conversations and the debates and all this stuff. And for someone to live in a world where someone has the capacity to say, I'm going to effectively buy a huge slice of the public sphere because I don't like the way it's working. Um, and I'm going to take something that's ostensibly private and make it ostensibly public and make it private for me is very, very dangerous. And it speaks to the danger of billionaires and, and just gross amounts of wealth accumulation in the world. The fact that he can buy this for 45 or 47 billion, billion with a B dollars and not really have any other discomfort in his life says, says everything to you about, about the gross inequality in the world. Um, there's another problem for me, um, which is how beholden many of us are to the whims of these corporatized media platforms, right? So we can think about Twitter as a free space and democratic space. Just like I could say I could have my own YouTube show until YouTube decides they don't want me to have no show. Right? I can tweet my behind off until they shut down my account. As much as I, I, I don't feel, I haven't lost a wink of sleep uh, on Donald Trump getting shut down on Twitter, there is a conversation to be had about what that means for something that operates as a public sphere to shut him down. Again, I'm not saying he shouldn't be shut down, because I think there need to be boundaries here. 
But what I'm saying is, is that it's not an entirely public sphere. And when those of us who challenge the powerful, whoever we are, um, are using our voices in the right way, we're very susceptible to being shut down. And with Elon Musk having more, more unilateral control over it, that scares me a lot. He talks about it as a bastion for free speech. Uh, no one will be shut down. You can say what you want here. That scares me too. I like the fact that you just can't be a white supremacist on Twitter easily, right? You gotta at least hide it a little bit. <laughs> you, you tuck it in, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but his idea is that somehow, I'll just let all things go. Does that, what, what does that mean for the person who's a child predator? Who does something that's not technically illegal but is gross to all of our moral and ethical sensibilities? What does it mean for the anti-Semite? What does it mean for the, for the anti-black racist? What does it mean for those people to now be able to promulgate their stuff? What does it mean for the anti, the person who's, who's, who's promoting uh, lies about COVID and about vaccines and about masking, right? And not just Trump, but a whole bunch of other folks. What does it mean when there's no mechanism of accountability because you are worshiping at the holy grail of free speech in this sort of abstract, grand, unnuanced way that's not even, as you pointed out, what was in, 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 historically intended. That all scares me. Um, and it also reminds me of why we need to have our own stuff. Let me add into that. Yes, so uh, I'll repeat what we talked about with Al Sharpton the other day because I think it is significant and important to keep on referencing. So the... You know, on his show. On his show, yes. We don't just have coffee. We're just hanging out with Sharpton. Right, right. <laughs> um, the, the notion of speech as the founders interpreted, and we're in Philadelphia, place where the founders are extremely important. Um, not that they shouldn't be important in every place, but they resonate on the streets here, right? Um, it was in this very city that the concept of uh, freedom of speech was first established with the First Amendment, reinterpreted later, and, 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 and it opened up to wider pattern of expression, pretty significantly after the First World War. But the notion was that the speech was to be constructive. They, they valued political speech at a higher level, for instance, than other forms of expression because they felt that, it, that speech contributes to the betterment of society. You know, it was a progressive idea, really, before the word progressive was being used in the way that we think of it now. It was that when I say something and then you add something to what I say, we become better as two than we were as one, right? But when speech loses its communicative value, when it becomes essentially more like an assault, it becomes like conduct, which is regulated by all, by all judgments about law and order, we would say conduct is the thing we're regulating. Then it becomes like an assault, and then it doesn't function like speech. It doesn't have communicative value. When you lie, when you uh, uh, use abusive speech that is intended to demean and, and, and annihilate an uh, entire race of people, you are not contributing to the public dialogue in a way that furthers the ambitions that the founders had when they thought of the freedom of speech. The freedom of speech was supposed to be constructive. So there's two ways in which Elon Musk is wrong about when he preaches freedom of speech. One is that, that he complains that, it's, that, that, uh, that voices are being censored. Well, only First Amendment only, only uh, uh, regulates government conduct, not private. The second is his misguided notion of what the founders meant by freedom of speech. And so when I hear him say that, I think two things. I think that, and then I also think you know, that the America's entire history has been a struggle between two um, uh, competing but, uh, uh, but similar notions, freedom and equality. Right? Mm -hmm. And we often value one more than the other, mostly the freedom more than the equality. But we need to have that balance. The tension between those needs to be part of how we create ourselves. And we need, therefore, to, when we have a, a public forum, a public sphere, to recognize not only that we want freedom of speech, but that we want equality of access to speech. Because without that, those who are not, who are denied it, are denied a freedom. Uh, so I will say I am Todd's son, so I, I'm going to ask Mark this question. Um, but uh, so I, I was no, you can't have the car on Saturday. <laughs> uh, no, but I, um, I just read like part of the book. I've read about 100 pages so far, and I got to the part about how you guys are talking about um, why Floyd resonated with the American public that that video, and um, I watched the Grand Rapids video, which was equally as hard to watch. Um, it was basically, a, I call it an execution. 
uh, I asked some people, my friends, about it. A lot of them had never even seen it. Um, I'm wondering if you guys can talk about what you talked about in the book with Floyd and your take on why the Grand Rapids video and the aftermath have not generated nearly as much traction online. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it's a good and interesting question. Um, I was talking to Todd the other day and I was saying, I think it was during an interview, I, I initially thought this and we started to talk through it. There's pr the George Floyd moment sparked a huge movement in this country. At the policy level, on the streets of, this, of all around the country, we saw something that we hadn't quite seen before. And you could argue that George Floyd is the touchstone moment of this time in the same way that we could say that, you know, 1955, August 1955 with Emmett Till was a touchstone moment that gets us into the Montgomery bus boycotts. But if you would have asked me the day before George Floyd was murdered, I would have bet my life that the Mike Brown was the moment. I couldn't imagine, I mean, the Ferguson summer seemed like the thing. It seemed like the touch point. It seemed like the thing that had changed this country and our converse, not changed the country, I don't use that language, but that had, had, had at least, it was imprinted on our memory. And I probably would have argued that Trayvon Martin was that moment before then. But in between Trayvon and, and, and Mike Brown and George Floyd is a whole bunch of stuff that doesn't move the needle. Some are more gruesome. Walter Scott is a more gruesome case, an incontrovertible act of malfeasance to me. I mean, the man was shot running away. Eric Garner, we had video of him being choked out with an illegal chokehold, with, an, with, an, with a, something that is, to be clear so the police don't sue me. It was against department regulation at the time. It wasn't technically illegal, but against department regulation, and he didn't need to be killed, clearly, right? But Daniel Pantaleo did it anyway. That didn't spark the outrage. Sandra Bland didn't spark the outrage. Breonna Taylor, Anisha McBride. We're going down the list, right? Tamir Rice, 13-year-old boy. So why some and not others? Why, some, why the outrage for this and not that? Some of it is about our own politics. Uh, we tend to prefer men than women as victims, right? We, we, th this country does not mourn the death of women, and certainly not black and brown women. It's simply the case. Um, patriarchy, sexism, misogyny all plays into how we do this. We prefer straight victims. When was the last time you saw a march for a queer man, right? Um, we, trans women, the summer, that, the summer that Mike Brown was killed, nine black trans women were killed. No outrage. I won't say no outrage, no national story. We prefer them to be middle class. We prefer them to be going to college. Think about Mike Brown. We had to, he was on his way to college that Monday. Not exactly true. Well, not true at all, actually. Um, but it enhanced our narrative. When they found out he stole a cigarillo from the store before he got shot by, by Darren Wilson, it was like, oh, some, especially my middle class bougie friends was like, oh, wait, no, this, this isn't the clean case we thought it was. So there's a way that we're looking for perfect victims and our, our notion of what it means to be perfect is to be male and straight and Christian and, and, and et cetera, et cetera, and cisgendered, et cetera, et cetera. And so this plays into why. Um, some of it is about the gruesomeness of it. That foot, you had to look at Mike Brown be executed for nine minutes. It's, it's hard to look away. Even Mike Brown, you could, you could read Darren Wilson's jury test, grand jury testimony, and hear him refer to Mike as it, and how he was, looked like he was walking through the bullets and all this crazy stuff, like, he, you know what I mean? But you had to watch this execution. It had the power of a still photo, because it didn't move, that knee didn't move, but it was the, the rawness of live video, so you had to sit with that. Some of it was, it was a pandemic. We were sitting there during a the pandemic. We were home, we were angry, we were poor, we were frustrated, we were tired. We'd already heard about Ahmaud Arbery. We, we just watched Christian Cooper get harassed in Central Park uh, for bird watching. It's a Harvard educated black man bird watching Central Park on Memorial Day. If that, if that ain't a safe brother. <laughs> and even he got harassed and, 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 and the whiteness was weaponized against him. So all this stuff plays an image. And then the last thing I said, I'm gonna pass the tie, is there's also a way that America has a very low threshold for this kind of stuff, right? White America is only gonna be outraged about black death but for so long. After Ferguson, we started being outraged about Trump again and we lost our way. Then, you know, then we found our way back to Ferguson. You know, then we'll lose our way to something else. It's not sustainable because black death largely is still acceptable. It's normalized in this country. And until we're genuinely, genuinely and generally outraged by it, I, I think you'll always have these occasional generational moments of outrage, but most of the stuff is gonna pass. And it was a knee on a neck. It was a knee on a neck, which is an image that 
is symbolic of the white uh, strangling of the black race in this country. Get your knee off my neck. Yeah. It is an expression that is so important to understanding. But it's not give me more programs. It's not give me more uh, affirmative action. It's get your knee off my neck. And so it had a symbolic resonance that went beyond um, it, it's uh, the actual action itself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's an element of theater to that, right? I mean, we have to acknowledge, I mean, the brilliance of the birth of a nation was it was a great piece of theater. It's an amazingly done film. The George Floyd video communicated on so many levels. It communicated with that, communicated with that symbolic notion of the knee on the neck. It communicated in nine minutes. It communicated like a crucifixion. He's calling out for his mother, mm -hmm. like Christ on the cross. These things resonate. I mean, we talked about the resonance of the myth of the lost cause. There are universal resonances with a knee on a neck, with a, a, a somebody being crucified, right? All that we talk about, we, the phrase we use in the book is that, you know, a, a shooting is an instant, uh, a, 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 a lynching is a, is a performance. Mm -hmm. Well, the, George Floyd was a lynching. And lynching has an extraordinarily powerful, is an extraordinarily powerful part of American history, something extraordinarily shameful. It's something that, that we, we all need, we know, know we need to come to terms with, as well as with slavery itself. And I would only bring it back, since we're coming to the end of this, to James Baldwin, because it was he who said, don't stop at these little Band-Aids, right? Look at the bigger picture. Look at the, the other, the Band-Aids will always be matched by new scars, right? Let's, let's try to see the whole totality of the problem and then respond to that. Only then, when we face what's really happened, can we change. Yeah. The book is Seen and Unseen, Technology, Social Media, and the Fight for Racial Justice. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking Mark Lamont Hill and Todd Brewster Thank for so writing this book and sharing their thoughts with us tonight.